Welcome, everybody. We are going to take just a minute more um, to let everybody um, into the webinar, and then we'll start the presentation. Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here today to talk about our latest report, uh, Hindu Nationalism in America, Assessing the Influence of Hindutva Ideology in the US. Um, to start, I just wanna thank everyone who's been involved um, in this report at ISPU. Um, it's been a tremendous amount of work. We're very grateful to the team, our PI, um, our supporters and, and to the panelists for joining us here today. Uh, my name is Sahar Salad and I'm the current director of research for the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. I'm an associate professor and previous chair of the sociology department at Simmons University here in Boston. My research centers on the experiences of Muslims with surveillance. In my first book, Forever Suspect, Racialized Surveillance of Muslim Americans in the War on Terror, published on Rutgers University Press, I examined how Muslim men and women experience gendered forms of racial, racialization through their hyper surveillance. In my um, second co-authored book with um, Dr. Inash Islam and Dr. Steve Garner, uh, A Global Racial Enemy, Muslims in 21st Century Racism, which is on Polity Press, we look at how the global war on terror has justified the detention, imprisonment, and hyper-surveillance of Muslims in the United States, the United Kingdom, China, and India. So rel somewhat relevant to today's um, study. But today we are here to discuss a new report that will be coming out in a few weeks by the Institute for Social Policy and Understand Understanding, where we examine the extent to which Hindutva resonates among Hindus in the US by survey surveying their views on identity, politics, and social issues and comparing them to the general public. Please do use the Q&A for your questions, the Q&A box for your questions. So a little bit about ISPU. Um, ISPU is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that builds understanding and strengthens communities by laying a foundation of facts. As the only organization of our kind, we're the go-to source for anyone seeking information about Muslims in America and the issues that impact them. We also share what we know in easily digestible ways with the general public, policymakers, media professionals, community leaders, and more. Our mission is to provide objective research and education about Americans who are Muslim to support well-informed dialogue and decision-making. Next slide, please. So today what we're gonna do is we're going to, I'm gonna give you a little bit about this study, tell you a little bit about the study. Um, we have uh, our one of our co-authors of the report who will um, discuss the key findings. And then we'll have a discussion with our panelists who we've invited today, including the PI for the um, study. And then we'll add, leave some time at the end for question and answers. So please, next slide. 
Um, we just want to give some acknowledgments to our research team. I will introduce um, Dr. Sabrina Ghaffar Siddiqui in a bit and Nicole Stewart Strang in a bit. Um, but um, just to acknowledge the research assistant, um, Zaid El uh, Kala, and our advisors that you can see here who were um, integral in, in getting this um, study and report um, completed. Next slide, please. And here are just some um, social media handles that you can use to follow us where we will be publishing more um, information about the release of the report, um, which will happen in the next few weeks. Next slide, please. Okay, so why did we decide to do this study? So we were very interested in Hindu nationalism known as Hindutva because it's been on the rise in India over the past several decades, particularly after the election of the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi. There has been a marked increase in violence, intolerance, and discrimination, discriminatory policies against Muslims, Dalits, Christian, and other religious minorities in India. And just to note, Hindutva is um, an ethno-religious nationalism popularized because of the perceived threat of Islam. And this is a, a definition by a scholar, Jafralat, um, that we use in the report. Next slide, please. Um, so. Hindu nationalism in the United States context, what we've what we've been seeing is US based arms of Hindu nationalist groups gaining and asserting power and influence in various sectors across the country, such as higher education, tech, um, government, and more. So an example is the India Day Parade that took place in 2022 in Edison, New Jersey, where a bulldozer was on display. And for those of you who may not know, the bulldozer has become a symbol of Hindu nationalism as Muslim homes and businesses um, in India have been bulldozed. So this is something that we're very interested in understanding is how is this ideology influencing people in the United States? So who are Indians in the United States? Well, the majority are South Asian, 80%. It's the second largest immigrant group um, in the United States. There's a growing number who are raised in the United States, and the majority are Hindu at 54% and then Muslim at 13%. Next slide. So why did we do this study? The main reason is that we are always interested in expanding ISPU's work on Islamophobia, which we capture in our American Muslim poll. Uh, so Hindus living in the United States are not a group are a group that are not normal. They have not normally been captured in large surveys. There have been a few that have come out more recently. But really, we're interested in understanding the influence of Hindutva ideology among U.S.-based Hindus on attitudes toward American Muslims, because this adds an important perspective to ISPU's body of work on Islamophobia and discrimination. By analyzing perceptions of religious and political identity and democratic values, the report presents the ways in which Hindutva ideology intersects with American values and institutions, potentially influencing public discourse and policymaking processes. Next slide. So a little bit about the methodology before I um, turn it over. Uh, we um, deployed a survey. The questionnaire was developed by ISPU's research team in consultation with the um, primary investigator where we asked questions about demographics, identity, discrimination. Um, we asked uh, questions about Islamophobia, views on policy, media consumption. Um, we, we Qualtrics fielded the um, survey. So in the survey, we have 604 self-identified Hindus residing in the United States, and we're able to compare the responses to the general public where we um, surveyed 704 of them. It was fielded between May 4th and May 26th of 2023. We employed demographic quotas matching um, the national estimates. And just to note that one of the limitations of a study like this is um, we use a non-probability sample, which can lead to some potential bias, which we tried to mitigate by using these demographic quotas. So next slide, I'm going to hand it over. I'd like to introduce um, Nicole Stewart Streng, who is an analyst and report co-author. She brings more than a decade of experience in social science research and analytics into her work of data storytelling to help her clients make 
data-informed decisions. She has extensive experience in primary data collection, quantitative and qualitative methodologies, and complex analysis. Nicole is passionate about understanding the human experience and has spent her career using data to uncover insights to determine how to make the human journey a little easier. She is a certified project management professional with experience in managing numerous research projects, and she's the co-author of this report. So thank you and welcome, Nicole, to um, talk about our findings. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm excited to dive into this data together. One contextual note uh, before we get started. Throughout the presentation, I might use the umbrella terms Hindu and the general public, but the percentages are referring throughout specifically to those groups in our sample. So let's begin by exploring who our study participants are and how they see themselves. We asked participants how important religious and national identity is in the way that they think of themselves. Religion is central to the identity of nearly half of the Hindus in our sample. 46% say that religion is very important to them, compared to only 39% of the general public. Second generation Hindus are more likely to say that religion is very important at 56%, compared to just 40% of first generation Hindus. A large proportion of Hindus say that religion is very important to them. Then the proportion that say that being Indian or being American is very important to them. The average level of religiosity among the Hindus in our sample is also higher than we see in the general public sample. 38% of Hindus say they attend religious service once a week, compared to only 21% of the general public, with second and third plus generation Hindus more likely to attend weekly religious service than their first generation counterparts. And only 2% of Hindus say that they have never attended religious service, compared to 22% of the general public. While being Hindu is an important part of Indian identity for 72% of the Hindus in our study, supporting the Modi government is also an important marker for many of being truly Indian. These findings indicate that the relationship between religion and national identity are often blurred with Hinduism being closely tied to Indian identity. Foreign-born Hindus that participated in our study are less likely to tie together religion and, and national identity than our second and third plus generation Hindus and appear to be less attached to Hindu religious identity. For instance, 62% of first generation Hindus say that being Hindu is an important marker for Indian identity compared to 81% of second and third plus generation Hindus. One reason that we may be seeing these differences by generation is that first generation respondents skewed older in our sample. Interestingly, the importance of support for the Modi government as a marker of Indian identity is markedly higher among Hindus in our samples whose families have lived in the U.S. longer. 67% of second generation and 65% of third plus generation Hindus say that supporting the Modi government is an important marker for being truly Indian, compared to only 39% of first-generation Hindus. Caste is also an important lens through which the Hindus in our study see themselves. And this is even more so for those that have never lived in India. For instance, 37% of second-generation Hindus and 41% of third-plus-generation Hindus say caste is very important to the way that they think about themselves compared to only 21% of first-generation Hindus.
Religious and national identity are both important to the way that many of the Hindus that participated in our study think about themselves. But when it comes to how they define Indian identity, we found a clear distinction between foreign-born Hindus and their first and it, between foreign-born Hindus and their second and third plus generation counterparts. First generation Hindus in our study are less likely to see religion, caste, and the support of the Modi government as markers of true Indian identity than those Hindus whose families have been in the U.S. for multiple generations. Okay. Um, the next section, we are going to explore the social and political beliefs of our sample. Like many Americans, the Hindus in our sample are commonly using social media as their primary news source. More than one third of them say that social media is their main news source about Modi politics. And even though social media is the main place they're going for information, 45% of Hindus in our study say it is the least trusted news source for Indian politi politics. These findings align with other research that suggests that trust in news media across platforms is at a near record low. Nearly half of the Hindus in our sample consider themselves Democrats, 49%, while 22% consider themselves Republicans and 26% identify as independent. Second and third plus generation Hindus are more likely to identify as Democrat than their first generation counterparts. A slightly smaller proportion of the US general public when compared to US Hindus identify as Democrats, 42%, and a slightly larger percentage identify as Republicans, 28%. While 55% of the Hindus in our sample describe themselves as somewhat or very liberal, liberal political views do not appear to be correlated with views of Modi's BJP. Hindus in the US with more liberal political affiliations and views are just as likely as those with more independent or conservative views to favor Modi's BJP. We asked respondents to rate how much of a problem discrimination against Hindus and Muslims is in the United States. Fewer than one in five of these Hindus say that discrimination of Hindus or of Muslims is a major problem. But the general public is more aware of discrimination against Muslims with 24% of them saying that it's a major problem. Since 2018, ISPU's American Muslim Poll has included the National American Islamophobia Index, measured across American faith and non-faith groups. This index measures the level of public endorsement of five negative stereotypes associated with Muslims in America. These five indicators were chosen by ISPU analysts based on previous research linking these perceptions with greater tolerance for anti-Muslim policies, such as mosque surveillance, racial profiling, greater scrutiny of Muslims at airports, the so-called Muslim ban, and taking voting rights away from Muslim Americans. These five measures are not meant to cover the totality of public Islamophobia, which can and does include many other false beliefs about Muslims. Instead, they are meant to offer an evidence-based measure of the perceptions known to be linked to the acceptance of discriminatory policies. When we compared the responses on the Islam Islamophobia Index, we found that Hindus in our studies scored eight points higher than the general public. 
And these scores did not vary for the for our Hindu respondents, regardless of their stated political views. So we see here that the liberal political views and non-liberal political views only had a difference of one point for our Hindu respondents. We also looked at respondent agreement with a number of anti-Muslim tropes. For nearly all of these statements, Hindus in our study were less likely to strongly disagree than the general public. For instance, only 15% of Hindus strongly disagree that Muslims are prone to violence compared to 33% of the general public. And these tropes and stereotypes are also embedded in pop culture. 87% of Hindus in our sample say that Bollywood contains or supports at least some stereotypes against Muslims. And 93% say Hollywood does the same. Further, half of the Hindus in our study agreed with at least some Hindu nationalist policies. 40% of Hindus agree that hatred towards the current Indian government equates with hatred towards India. 50% of Hindus agree with the Citizenship Amendment Act in India, which offers amnesty to migrants from neighboring countries while excluding Muslims from those same countries. The same proportion of Hindus agree that the demolition, demolition of quote-unquote illegal churches and mosques in India is lawful and important. While those Hindus in our sample who espouse liberal views are less likely to agree with these Indian policies that disproportionately target Muslims, there is still agreement on these policies among at least one-third of liberal Hindus. Jai Shri Ram is a Hindu expression that translates to victory to Lord Ram, a Hindu deity described as just, brave, self-sacrificing, and righteous. Although still a religious phrase for many, it is now associated with Hindu food ideology and weaponized as a rallying cry for Hindu nationalism. This phrase evokes a combination of nationalism and spirituality among the Hindus in our study. Feelings vary greatly across generational status. First generation Hindus are far less likely than second and third plus generation Hindus to report that the slogan evokes nationalism and far more likely to say that they associate it with spirituality. While more than three quarters of the Hindus in our sample said that they wanna live in a country where there are religious freedoms, more than a third of them agree with policies that restrict those freedoms for Muslims. For instance, 38% agree that the US should ban hijabs in public schools and universities. Hindus are less likely than the general public to strongly oppose infringements on the rights of Muslims in the US. For instance, only 29% of the Hindus in our sample say that they strongly oppose a ban on visas to Muslims wait, wanting to enter the US. And only 25% say they strongly oppose surveillance programs targeting mosques in the US. While the Hindus in our study are more likely than the general public to affiliate with the Democratic Party and espouse liberal views, their beliefs about Muslims and their positions on US and Indian policies are negatively impacting Muslims do not necessarily align. And these political beliefs may influence their political engagement. In this final section, we will explore the civic engagement of Hindus in our sample and how it varies by generational status. A higher proportion of the Hindus in our study were civically engaged than the general public. For instance, 
41% of Hindus say that they volunteered for a U.S. campaign in the prior 12 months, compared to only 14% of the general public. And the level of civic engagement is highest among second and third plus generation Hindus. And these later generations are more likely not only to volunteer their time to US campaigns, but to also contribute their money to US organizations that support the Modi government. What is even more interesting when exploring the political engagement of Hindus making up um, our sample is that those with favorable views of the BJP are more likely to be politically engaged in both US and Indian politics. And Hindus who support Hindutva ideas and policies are more likely to contribute financially to US organizations that support the Modi government. For instance, 48% of the Hindus in our sample who support the demolition of mosques in India have contributed financially to these types of organizations compared to 34% of those who do not. The Hindus that participated in our study are politically engaged both in the US and abroad and those who have favorable views of the Modi government are more politically active than those who do not share those views, increasing the likelihood that these views are influencing American political life. And those are the main findings. So I will um, pass it back. I'll stop my share and pass it over. Thank you so much, Nicole, for presenting the data so clearly and sharing some of the highlights from the report. Really appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to introduce now our panelists, and then I'm going to um, pose, I have a question for each panelist that they'll respond to. They'll only have seven minutes um, per question, and, and then we will open it up to uh, the Q&A. So please do use the Q&A box to ask your questions. Um, Dr. Ghaffar Siddiqui is a globally recognized multiple award-winning public speaker, well-known media pundit, renowned researcher and policy advisor and a pas passionate social justice advocate. As well as being a professor of sociology, criminology and criminal psychology, she runs her own equity, diversity, inclusion and justice consultancy firm. She is also principal investigator on this study with the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. Dr. Ghaffar Siddiqui's doctoral research explored the ways in which Muslim communities in the West navigate their social worlds in a post-9-11 climate. She is regularly invited as an expert witness and policy advisor for government-led studies and policy initiatives and is a sought-after thought leader and cultural critic featured on major media outlets like BBC News, The New York Times, CBC News, CTV, CTV News, and others. Safa Ahmed is the Associate Director of Media and Communications for the Indian American Muslim Council, the largest and oldest Muslim diaspora organization focused on com combating Hindu nationalism. Her writings on Hindu nationalism have appeared in Al Jazeera, The Diplomat, Jacobin, Progressive Magazine, and others. Welcome, Safa. Pranay Somayad. Jula is an Amer Indian American writer and organizer based in Washington, D.C. He currently serves as um, organizing and advocacy director for Hindus for Human Rights, an organization that was founded in 2019 to provide a Hindu voice of resistance to caste, Hindutva, and all forms of bigotry and oppression. In his organizing and his writing, Pranay works to bring together diverse histories and struggles for justice to build solidarity between movements and peoples from South Asia to Palestine and beyond. His writing has been featured in Jacobin, The Nation, and The Drift, as well as on his Substack blog, Culture Shock. Welcome. Harman Singh serves as the executive director of the Sikh Coalition, the largest Sikh civil rights organization in the United States. 
For more than 20 years, the Sikh Coalition has defended Sikh civil liberties in the community courtrooms, classrooms, and halls of Congress. Whether it's working to secure safer schools, prevent hate and discrimination, create equal employment opportunities, or empower local Sikh communities, the Sikh Coalition's goal is working towards a world where Sikhs and other religious minorities in America may freely practice their faith without bias and discrimination. In this leadership role, Harmon manages the day-to-day -day operations of the Sikh Coalition and is responsible for shaping and implementing the organization's strategic plan. Prior to joining the coalition, Harmon spent seven years working in higher education and earned his BA in history, MED in educational psychology, and MA in dispute resolution from Wayne State University. Thank you all for joining us today. It's a real pleasure to have you here. I'm going to start with my first question for Dr. Ghaffar Siddiqui. As the PI of the um, report, could you speak to some of the surprises in the survey data that you conducted with ISPU, specifically about the influence of Hindutva ideologies on second and third generations of Hindu Americans? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Um, I just wanted to kind of like pull up some of the major points that stuck out for me. And as, as you can appreciate, I've been uh, doing this research for two years, so, you know, been heavily engrossed in it. Um, but I can admit that going in, you know, there were certain things that I expected uh, based on previous research done, you know, based on previous social psychology concepts um, relating to racism or discrimination. Um, and, you know, one of them, which I believe is a myth that is currently being uh, getting dispelled as well is this idea that there is a political spectrum and we've got this liberal left and conservative right and racism always ends up on that right of that spectrum um, and so this myth of a political spectrum that's very clearly defined and with people who espouse democratic liberal values are less likely to be racist or discriminative in their views, more likely to be woke. Uh, this is, I believe, a myth that was uh, dispelled through this study, as we can see that there was really no difference with the Islamophobia index between people who were Democratic or, or Republican. The other myth that I feel was uh, dispelled is this idea that education and awareness or you know, living in a democratic Western, again, what's perceived to be like a very democratic Western um, civilized society would allow someone to hold more um, appreciation for human rights and democracy. At least this is what we're told. Um, and in our research, we see that second or third generation Hindus um, were actually more likely to to hold views that align when, with Hindutva ideology. Um, so this idea of education and awareness being the 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 fix that you know we can we can fix um, uh, racism or discrimination through education this kind of um, pushes back on that a little bit. Uh, the other thing um, that was really um, key for me were like some contradictions and inconsistencies in people's beliefs about democracy and human rights, which, uh, you know, again, this idea of there being a Muslim exception, possibly, right? So you can have beliefs about the human rights of everyone but Muslims. So you can be, you can believe in anyone's right to, to live freely and practice their faith freely. However, when it comes to Muslims, that, you know, the data kind of distorts that idea a little bit. Um, and, and even so, like you could believe that Muslims in America have the right to live freely, but then that, that data isn't shown as clearly for Muslims in India. Um, the other thing is the power of popular media and social media, you know, as Nicole pointed out that um, a vast majority of the sample believed that social media was not reliable and yet they continue to engage in it. And that was the primary source of kind of news information about the Modi government. Um, the other the other point that was important is that, you know, uh, a vast majority of respondents agreed that Bollywood and Hollywood uh, show stereotypes about Muslims. And that 
kind of like to agree that something is a stereotype is to agree that um, it's not true necessarily. It's a stereotype. It could possibly be a myth. It doesn't actually define a group. Um, so to it, it proves that it's something that they understand, that it's an understood idea, but then continue to espouse or to hold beliefs that are Islamophobic. Um, and then the final thing that I just want to say, like in, you know, to, to just kind of like insert a little bit of hope maybe, um, is that I, I believe the study kind of reinforces this idea, uh, Gordon Alport's concept and theory of contact theory, this idea that, you know, if you have contact with people from other cultures and other groups, you're less likely to hold discriminative views. And perhaps that's something that we're seeing where we see that the first generation who I, to be honest with you, thought were more likely to hold uh, Hindutva ide ideological views were shown to be least likely. And perhaps it's because of contact theory, because they lived at a time in India where there was more social co cohesion or cohesion between cultures and maybe living amongst in a multicultural society like that, multi-religious society like that, allows you to 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 hold less discriminative views. So those are just some of my main um, uh, thoughts, uh, but happy to answer any questions in the discussion portion. Thank you so much for that. I mean, I think you provide a lot of in important points from the report that definitely will garner more questions, more um, discussion. Um, Safa, I, I have the next question is for you. Um, you know, at I, IAMC just came out with a report entitled Detrimental Effects of Hindu Nationalism on Indian American Muslims. So there are a lot of surveys and reports coming out. One just came out, you know, just a, a day or two ago, um, another report. So could you speak for, for to us today about some of the key findings from that report? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, I want to first talk about the reason why we felt the need to conduct the survey, um, and the answer is quite simple. It's something ISPU also touched upon. It's because we want to show that this is not just an India issue or a question that influences only the U.S.-India relationship or foreign policy. Like, this is a domestic issue that is affecting American Muslim lives, and specifically, we did look at the Indian Muslim community because this was a community survey. Um, but in the end, we did want to start a larger conversation. How does Hindu nationalism... Um, this ideology that has been exported and is now taking root in the United States, how does that affect the Muslim community here? Um, and so the findings of our report um, do reflect some alarming trends. Uh, and again, this is a community survey. Th these were people, um, Indian Muslims specifically, from all over the United States who reported in with their experiences with Hindu nationalism from either Hindu social contacts or colleagues or neighbors or even former friends. Um, and one of the first things we saw was that discrimination and exclusion of or against Indian Muslims within the diaspora is pretty widespread. Um, so we collected responses from just under a thousand people all over the United States. And 81% of respondents in this survey reported experiencing harassment, discrimination, or prejudice from Hindu friends or social contacts over the past decade. 70% of respondents experienced biased treatment from Hindu colleagues, 48% of respondents reported harassment on social media, including Facebook, WhatsApp, WhatsApp and LinkedIn. Um, and again, I, I say over the past decade, uh, just to clarify, uh, we mean since the rise of Prime Minister Narendra Modi in India and his far right Bharatiya Janata Party or the BJP. Um, and to that point, uh, Muslims are being isolated in and driven out from Indian American spaces since the rise of the BJP, which really brought Hindu nationalism as an ideology into the mainstream and made it uh, something that is no longer taboo to publicly espouse. So 80% of Muslim respondents say that they feel less comfortable in Indian American spaces since the rise of the BJP in India. And really importantly, not a single respondent reported feeling more comfortable. There were some who said, yeah, we don't really notice a difference, but the vast majority either said they feel less comfortable, not a single person said that they feel more comfortable. Um, and like you mentioned, Sahar, there was the recent example of um, Indian Independence Day celebrations being turned into celebrations of Hindu nationalism and Hindu chauvinism. Um, and there was this, another similar example in 2024 uh, with the glorifying of Aram Temple float um, in New York City in uh, just like a few, uh, just like in August, actually. Um, so 
the results of this increased discrimination and harassment result is a mental and emotional toll on Indian American Muslims. So respondents reported feeling uh, a lot more isolation, fear, emotional fatigue. They noted that Hindu friends and neighbors, and these are people they were once comfortable with, um, are now changing their behavior towards Muslims. And that's a quote from one of the survey respondents. Uh, one person reported losing friends to Hindu nationalist Islamophobia. Um, another reported that uh, their children uh, were isolated from Hindu friend groups at school. So this is kind of a generational issue as well. Um, another finding being that Indian American Muslims really fear for their family's safety overseas. So in response to uh, rising hate crimes and anti-Muslim hate speech in India, um, including explicit calls for ethnic cleansing and uh, genocide, and Muslims in the U.S. are feeling are feeling like there is a risk of their friends and family abroad being harmed. They're fearing for their general safety. 94% um, of respondents strongly agree that Hindu nationalism poses a threat to religious minorities, particularly Muslims and Christians um, in India, but also in the United States. So 86% of respondents saw Hindu nationalism as a threat to their own rights, their own uh, democracy in the U.S., and they cited concerns about the infiltration of Hindu nationalist ideology into U.S. Po uh, politics, uh, certain far-right figures that do tend to push Hindu nationalist narratives, um, and also in academia. So um, overall, uh, I'll, I'll wrap it up here because this is a very uh, high level um, recap of what the survey's findings are. Uh, but we also want to add that these findings are likely an underestimation of the issue. Um, there was less than a thousand individuals who were surveyed. Um, but we at IMC have had at least 20 years watching how Hindu nationalism and support for Muslim disenfranchisement has gone from a fringe ideology in India to a movement that is so widespread um, that it's, you know, it's becoming more and more of a problem for the global Muslim community. And so we're really grateful that ISP is also starting to take a look at this issue um, and that more and more people are beginning to put out research about this because it's so incredibly important um, in understanding how many dimensions anti-Muslim sentiment takes on in the United States. Um, and the last thing I want to wrap up with is what we think needs to happen is that there needs to be even more added to the conversation, even more research uh, needs to be done on the proliferation of Hindu supremacy in the U.S. and how that affects vulnerable communities. Um, and I'll stop there because I know I've said a lot, uh, but happy to take any more questions later on. Thank you so much. No, thank you for that. And it truly fills out some of the findings that we have as well. So a lot of these surveys really work together where they're, they're, you know, we're able to highlight why are some of these findings in our survey and, and your survey is certainly, um, you know, fills out what's the impact on um, Indian Muslims in the United States. So this is not just happening over there. This is a global phenomenon. What happens there impacts Muslims here. What happens here impacts um, Muslims there. And so really important work. Thank you. Um, Pranay, I, ha I have you next. And um, based on your work with Hindus for Human Rights and your articles, um, can you talk about the ways you see Hindu nationalism exerting its influence in the United States? So Safa just gave us the impact on Indian Muslims. Um, could you talk about, you know, how is this happening? And if you have time, can you speak to the work you were doing with the Severa Coalition? Just saw that new report. That's amazing. Um, and what they're doing to fight against Hindu nationalism in the United States. Absolutely. Thank you so much, um, Sahar, and to everyone at ISPU for um, organizing this webinar, for putting out this report, and for, of course, having me um, here. Um, and, you know, I think Safa actually really queued, uh, queued this up really well by talking about the impact that this, uh, that this Hindu nationalist movement, Hindu, Hindu supremacist movement is having on Indian Muslims in the U.S. Um, in terms of how this movement functions, I think it's understanding the way it's structured here in the U.S. is really important to understanding how it exerts pressure. Because, um, you know, folks who have a sort of any familiarity with how Hindu or Hindu nationalism operates in India knows that, you know, the, the political representation is in the form of the BJP, the ruling party. Um, and there's an affiliated organization called the RSS, which is, you know, um, a massive uh, paramilitary organization. Um, but the RSS and BJP aren't the only organizations in India. They sit at the center of a really vast and very complex and intricate network of organizations that's often called the Sung or the Sung Parivar, which means the family of organizations. Um, and in that sense, you know, that model of a very decent, of, of a, of a, um, 
intricate web of interconnected organizations that share personnel, share funding, share leadership, but are sometimes in, in different degrees um, independent of one another, has essentially been transplanted here to the U.S. by Hindu supremacist groups. So you have the the RSS in India has its American counterpart, the HSS, the Hindu Swayam Civic Sangh. Um, and in India, the RSS, uh, its religious and cultural wing is called the VHP, the Vishwa Hindu Parishad, which again in the U.S. has its own American counterpart, the Vishwa Hindu Parishad of America or the VHPA. And the VHPA is really important because it is in many ways the central node of the Sung infrastructure here in the U.S. It is affiliated, again, through whether that's through shared funding streams, shared leadership, coordination on programming and events and advocacy, all these different ways that it's connected. It's connected to many other organizations that make up the Hindu supremacist ecosystem in the U.S. Um, and Sahara, you mentioned Hindus for Human Rights work with Severa. Um, so we are one of the members of the Severa United Against Supremacy Coalition, um, along with other organizations, including um, Indian American Muslim Council and Safa and I work very closely on Severa's work. Um, over the course of this year, Severa has put out a series of three reports um, examining different aspects of the Hindu supremacist network here in the U.S. Um, and uh, in particular, uh, the first two reports focus on the VHPA. It ties not only to the VHP and Hindu supremacist groups in India and the violence and the hate spread by those groups in India, but also its ties to other segments of the far right here in the US, whether we're talking about the January 6th Capitol insurrection where a VHPA leader was president and participating, whether we're talking about um, you know, anti-Muslim extremists like Pamela Geller, Robert Spencer, and others who, who have collaborated closely with the VHPA and its various affiliates. Uh, but the most recent Severa report actually came out just yesterday, Sahara, you mentioned this, um, on the Hindu American Foundation, which I think is in some ways the most important organization to understand because of the way that the Hindu American Foundation, which positions itself as a very legitimate mainstream, uh, a civil rights organization is really how it positions itself, an advocate for Hindu Americans, and it claims to speak for all Hindu Americans. Uh, and what that does, and the report really goes into great detail about this, it highlights the ways that Hindu American Foundation and its leadership came out of the VHP and its network. The, the leaders of the Hindu American Foundation, its co-founders and current leadership, all cut their teeth in the VHPA and its student wing and other affiliates of that group. Um, and the ways that even as it claims to be a civil rights organization, it has been able to represent Hindus in you know mainstream liberal civil society and civil rights spaces. It has also served essentially as a mouthpiece for the BJP government in India, for the Hindu supremacist movement, um, it you know they have uh, leaders of the Hindu American Foundation have welcomed Modi to the U.S. on his visits. They have advocated for policy priorities that uh, align with the BJP's anti-Muslim uh, policies in India. And you know perhaps most insidiously, they have tried to entrench Hindu Hindutva ideology among Hindu Americans by really trying to mainstream this notion of Hindu phobia, this idea that Hindus in the diaspora face severe systemic and persistent you know, discrimination and hate on the same level of anti-Semitism or Islamophobia or any other form of hate. And this isn't to say that Hindus don't experience discrimination and we're a minority, of course we do. But the, the, the term Hindu phobia came out of Hindu right-wing spaces. It was coined by ideologues in those spaces. The term, it has been vastly overstated and is also weaponized against anyone who criticizes Hindu nationalism, anyone who criticizes Modi or the Indian government um, in the same way that accusations of anti-Semitism are often weaponized against pro-Palestine activists or critics of the Israeli government. Um, and that's a very concrete tactic by which the Hindu supremacist movement, particularly the Hindu American Foundation, but more broadly speaking, Hindu nationalists here in the U.S., have been able to sort of mainstream um, and legitimize their politics in the uh, in the eyes of well-meaning liberals who don't want to be seen as Hindu phobic, just like they don't want to be seen as Islamophobic or homophobic or any other type of phobic. Um, and so that's a really key way that the um, I would say that the Hindu nationalist movement in the U.S. Uh, sort of entrenches its power, um, particularly um, on college campuses. We've seen increasing efforts to reach out to, uh, as you know, ISPU's report highlights, second and third generation Hindus, um, often by sort of using not just the language of civil rights, but 
overtly progressive and left-wing language. For example, framing the politics of Hindu nationalism as a project of decolonization, talking about using the language of indigeneity um, and, and anti-colonial rhetoric to, to, that, that resonates with young progressive South Asian Americans. Um, and so that's another way that we've seen this movement really digging its uh, heels in and gaining more support among young Hindu uh, Hindu Americans. Um, I know I'm coming up on on time here, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any other questions that folks may have. So I'll just really encourage folks to check out um, Severa's research, the first uh, two reports on the VHPA, and especially the report we released just yesterday, along with Political Research Associates on the Hindu American Foundation. I think those reports really function in some ways as a cohesive whole because it highlights a um you know the broader structures at play when we talk about how this movement operates here in the US. And I'll stop there, but thank you so much. No, thank you. That that really does add a lot of context um and to to what we're talking about right now. And it's um it, it's it's really a much, much larger issue than you know than than we even know. And so we really appreciate um your feedback on this and your participation here. The reports from IAMC and Severa are being um, put in the chat for participants to, to look at as well, just so you know. Um, so Harman, um, last question for you from me. Um, can you describe some of the work that the Sikh Coalition has been doing around supporting Sikh activists in the United States and how this is tied to Hindu nationalism? Yeah, absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here. And, and I'll, I'll really focus this on an outcome of Hindu, Hindu ideology that the Sikh community is dealing with right now, which are threats to the civil rights and of U.S. basics that are emerging from the government of India. And specifically, I'm referring to transnational repression, which, you know, for those who aren't familiar, it's defined as when governments stalk, intimidate or assault people here in the United States. And so a lot of folks in the global Sikh diaspora have long known and harbored suspicions that the government of India was working to chill dissent, discredit, threaten or harm Sikhs around the world. And for several decades, US basics in particular have raised the alarm about the role of Indian consulates, proxies, media sources, hard informants, oftentimes what people call agents, uh, targeting Sikhs here in the United States. Uh, but explicit allegations of Indian transnational repression by other nation states didn't become part of the mainstream dialogue until June of last year. But before we get to the more recent events, I do think there is some historical context that's really necessary here to better understand the modern wave of Indian transnational repression and why it is of such particular concern to the Sikh community here in the United States. And so the context in terms of a lot of this language is that for the past four decades, uh, a Sikh independence movement sought to carve out a separate nation state called Khalistan in the Punjab region of South Asia. And so there's a self-determination demand for Khalistan, which while not shared by all Sikhs, um, does have roots in deep historical and cultural differences between Sikhs and the modern Indian state. And so if you look back at the Sikh empire, it was once an independent political entity. It existed for roughly 50 years in Punjab, predating both modern India and British colonial India. And many Sikhs believe that their rights predating both modern India and that time were suppressed by the Indian state. And a lot of those concerns really came to a head in the mid 20th century. Uh, you can look at Operation Blue Star, the 1984 Sikh genocide, and then a subsequent decade of dis disappearances of Sikhs in India that were organized by the government of India and played a significant role in these calls for self-determination. And so there's a lot of ample history before that as well. Obviously, we won't have time to get into that. But suffice to say that the events from the violence from 1984 to the mid-90s and then additional political repression since informed some opinions of Sikhs in the diaspora for the viability or need of a Khalistan, um, especially here in the United States, given that many Sikhs immigrated from India to the United States to escape violence to seek asylum from what they experienced in 1984 as well. And so the increase in modern Indian transnational oppression, you really can't discuss that without reflecting on the general political trajectory and the ideological bent of Prime Minister Modi um, and the BJP. And so obviously the BJP, um, you know, a Hindu nationalist party, uh, under their tenure, international human rights organizations have documented declines in press freedom, increasing mistreatment of religious minorities, um, suppression of peaceful protests, use of internet blackouts, harassment of NGOs, uh, and Prime Minister Modi himself makes no secret about his government's ideological orientation, right? Just earlier this year, he said at a campaign rally that uh, even India's enemies know this new India comes into your home to kill you. And unfortunately, that's exactly what's happening right now here in the United States and in Canada, right? In June 2023, Canadian Sikh Hardeep Singh Nijjar, Gurdara president in Vancouver, British Columbia, 
uh, and a Khalistan referendum organizer. He was shot to death in his car outside of a Gurdwara Sikh house of worship. Uh, over 34 bullets were fired at Hardeep Singh Nijjar. The assailants fled the scene on foot before escaping in a getaway car. Uh, and all the details immediately suggested that this was a premeditated murder um, and a planned execution. In September of last year, the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, announced that Canadian intelligence agencies uh, were pursuing credible allegations of a link between the government of India and the murder of Hardeep Singh Nijjar in British Columbia. And this is a very notable week for us to have this conversation because just a few days ago, uh, the RCMP, which is essentially Canada's equivalent to the FBI, declared India a significant public safety risk for its targeting of Sikh Canadians on Canadian soil through the use of organized crime. And they included evidence of the Indian government being involved in home invasions, drive-by shootings, arsons, and at least one additional murder in Canada. And at least six Indian diplomats serving in Canada were directly involved in gathering detailed intelligence on Sikh activists who were then killed, attacked, or threatened by India's criminal proxies. And this even includes India's top diplomat in Canada and its top consular official in Toronto. So this is really alarming. It's kind of breathtaking information that was released this week about the experiences of Canadian Sikhs. Uh, but here in the United States, um, there, those concerns are very real as well, right? In November of last year, the U.S. Department of Justice unsealed an indictment detailing charges against an Indian arms and narcotics trafficker who collaborated with a representative of the government of India to plan at least one assassination of a Sikh American in New York City. The text messages included in the indictment said that there were, quote, so many targets to pursue and that he was just one of many Sikhs who would be targeted here on U.S. soil for their views on Khalistan or their activism within the Sikh community. And so while these murder plots and these assassination attempts are the more immediate concerns, um, we at the Sikh Coalition spoke with Gurdwaras, Sikh academics, Sikh journalists, Sikh elected officials, who all in some form or another shared that they faced harassment, intimidation, and threats emerging from the government of India. Um, you know, I'll briefly just mention one case study that I think is really relevant because mobility controls uh, the ability of Sikhs to travel to and from India um, or targeting Sikhs who are have family or friends in India has been a real concern. And so, you know, the Stockton Gurdwara in California is the oldest Gurdwara in the United States. Um, and when we spoke to that Gurdwara in a lot of public reporting and interviews they provided, um, in September of last year, a man walked into the Stockton Gurdwara, had a conversation with one of the Gurdwara leaders. Um, and according to the Gurdwara, the individual said that he was a representative of the government of India. He warned the Gurdwara that the government of India is watching them, is aware of their activities, and that the Gurdwara must stop its activism. He also showed them an ID card and said he worked for U.S. immigration. And if that the Gurdwara did not stop their activities, um, they would not get visas and that they would have immigration concerns if they didn't listen to them. And so to us, this is a real, um, really alarming situation, right? The goal of this is obviously to chill dissent, to chill conversation, and to provide a real concern for members of the community to be able to advocate for their beliefs, to practice their faith, um, and to be able to express their views freely here in the United States. And to underscore the concerns, I think it's relevant to say that even a sitting U.S. Congresswoman who is a Hindu woman, Pramila Jayapal, herself said that she is always thinking about when she criticizes Modi, what is the impact on her family and if she will be allowed to go back to India. And so if a sitting U.S. Congresswoman is concerned about her ability to go to India based off of her um, statements about Prime Minister Modi, certainly individuals here in the United States who are six who want to freely express their views um, have real concerns about uh, the issues that are impacting them. And, and so I'll just be clear, right? The issue of the government of India targeting six in the United States, there's no longer a debate about whether this is happening, right? It's been confirmed in some way or another by the DOJ, the Secretary of State, the NSC, members of the US House and Senate, the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. All of them have said that in some way, shape or form, the government of India is targeting six here in the United States. And I should also mention that even reporting just from today from the Sacramento Bee indicates that supporters of Prime Minister Modi asked the former police chief of Fresno, California to quote, follow the director of the Jakarta movement, which is a California grassroots organization. And so the rising Hindutva here in the United States for the Sikh community is of immediate safety concern, right? This is not uh, for us kind of a philosophical question of what happens long-term to the Sikh community. In the immediate short term, members of our community have faced assassination attempts, targeted violence, intimidation, um, and real mobility controls to be able to travel to and from India without facing violence or targeted um, action. And so I'll pause there, but would love to obviously share more uh, about some of the Sikh community's concerns 
around this form of TNR that is emerging in our belief out of this Hindutva ideology um, as well. Thank you so much for sharing that perspective. Very important to this discussion. So very appreciative of you um, um, participating in this panel. We do have a lot of questions. So I am going to um, start asking them because this has generated a lot of um, uh, thought provoking questions from our audience members. So um, I, I'm going to start with a, the first one, which is a, a fairly, um, perhaps I'll, I'll pass it to Pranay, if you want to take this on, just uh, why the bulldozer as a symbol um, for Islamophobia, uh, you know, if you want to touch on that quickly. Yeah. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, it's a great question. Um, and, you know, when you say the, the bulldozer has come to be used as a symbol of, of Islamophobia in India, it has been adopted. There's a reason why it was paraded in the India Day Parade by far right Hindu groups, but it's it, what it refers to very concretely is the policy that Indian uh, far right government officials, particularly in the state of Uttar Pradesh, which is led by one of the most like extreme right wing governments in the country, um, the policy of deliberately bulldozing and tearing down Muslim homes, shops and neighborhoods that they deem like, you know, essentially what will happen is particularly in very poor and working class and marginalized Muslim neighborhoods, the, the local government authorities will say these buildings are illegal con uh, constructions. They've been built without authorization. They're encroaching on government land. So we're going to send in bulldozers to tear them down. They frame it as trying to, you know, as say these buildings aren't up to code. They haven't been approved. But everybody knows that this is a, a tool of intimidation and oppression against Muslims in India. Um, and it, it's very similar to the way that the Israeli military and government he bulldozes, um, you know, Palestinian homes in the occupied West Bank, for example. Um, and in, in fact, it's, you know, worth pointing out that the, the same company uh, makes the bulldozers used by both governments um and but uh, to do that so that's that's why the bulldozer has become a symbol of of this thank you so much for clarifying that um another question is um i think about the study and the role of social media and did social media play a role in the increased identity alignment in the sample and what role does social media play in exacerbating violence to and by hindus in the united states so sabrina um would you want to address that question about the role of social media i don't actually have the data on that in front of me um nicole um i'm gonna I'm going to ask Nicole if if you have, because I don't think we asked that question specifically with regards to social media. I don't think we asked that question um, in this study. It was simply like use of social media, um, well, beliefs about it being reliable or not reliable, and then, you know, just kind of like use of it. Um, if anything, this question in the survey was really kind of like sparking a little light for further research for others to kind of like uh, jump in and 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 notice how powerful social media is, especially WhatsApp and especially what we know about WhatsApp lynchings in India and how uh, many of the lynching, for many of the lynchings, WhatsApp was a vital tool in finding Muslims to lynch. Um, so uh, those were the only questions we had asked, um, but I, I do, I think that the question you were asking is important and it begs further research. Thank you. And if anybody else wants to jump in on social media and what you're seeing, please do. Um, but I know that we had some questions that, um, you know, asked about social media in our survey. Um, another question is to, you know, anyone on the panel, how many and where do, do RSS, HSS, Shakas operate in the U.S.? How do they use Shakas to recruit the second and third generation Indian Hindus? So, you know, how that's what our data shows is it's second and third plus generation. So if anybody wants to take that on. I can say something which maybe can open others to jump in um, and add their thoughts. This is anecdotal um, and this is based on the literature review and other research I conducted outside of the. So we don't specifically have survey data on this, but. Um, from my understanding, 
an interesting element of our data that connects to this is that um, the um, um, younger generations and second and third generation Hindus who attend religious services and, and visit temples and how that, to me, it was actually quite surprising to see that uh, how common it was. And then what we read from other literature is that many uh, kind of temples that are right leaning, even though I hate using this left and right thing now, but that are Hindu nationalist leaning will recruit younger generations through sermons that take place in those temples. Um, so there's a, there's a connection there um, which I, again, I think needs to be further explored, but I do think that obviously social media and Pranay makes a really good point about using decolonization language and woke language, similar to what, you know, Zionists in the diaspora are doing, uh, saying that Israel is decolonizing itself, um, you know, through, through the genocide. So um, I'll, I'll kind of pass it over to someone else if they want to jump in. I can actually add um, a little bit of context to that too. Um, you know, I off the top of my head don't know how many like HSS shakas there are um, here in the US, but actually an important, I think, distinction to draw is that in India, the RSS is really the central nervous system of the Hindutva movement. And the RSS shakha, which just means like chapter or branch or all over India, is like the, 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 the default nodal unit of that. In the U.S., the HSS does have a presence, but in some ways, when we're talking about how Hindu supremacy operates in the U.S., the HSS is in some ways less directly at the center of that. It's the VHPA that is far more active in terms of the right-wing politics um, and bringing Hindu Americans towards the far right. The HSS uh, presence at a local level in the U.S. often focuses much more on, you know, the fairly innocuous um like just like religious and cultural programming geared towards families with young kids and that sort of thing um and you know we know that the hss network is often uses charitable uh, associations to funnel large amounts of money to um far right groups in india through um charities like sewa international for example but really it's the vhpa that actually is aligning itself with the far right it has vhpa has chapters i think in I want to say 28 or so states, but I could be wrong about that. But it has chapters all over the country, as well as in particular, its student its, uh, student wing is the Hindu Students Council that is active on many campuses around the U.S. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's an important, I think, distinction to draw in that the U.S. really, the VHPA is the focus, is, is the main focus, which is why Severa focused our reports on the VHPA rather than the HSS. I think I might just jump in and ask a follow up for Safa then. So if you're talking about, you know, we're finding second and third generation, you're talking about college campuses and this, you know, way to get younger Hindu Americans. <clears throat> Are we seeing the impact on colleges um, for Muslims uh, in your work? Have you found some kind of connection here? So for our uh, survey specifically, we didn't have a huge sampling of college age students. I would say a lot of this was aimed towards people who are in the workplace, who are, you know, maybe of that age where they're more likely to like go to Indian cultural festivals that are like aimed at families, et cetera, and things like that. Um, there is definitely, I, there's a lot of anecdotal experiences that we have heard of uh, from IMC, including, you know, my own personal experiences where we see kind of this soft, uh, Hindutva, these soft uh, Hindu supremacist narratives kind of being um, circulated among younger people. Um, and a lot of times, like, I really do have to make this distinction. Sometimes it's not even out of malice and it's not even out of allegiance to any sort of supremacist ideology on its face. It's really uh, just speaking to the proliferation um, of the myths that this ideology tends to push about uh, the idea of Muslim belonging, the idea of um, Hindu victimhood, specifically upper caste uh, Brahmin Hindu victimhood in India. So it's this uh, warping of narratives that we see. It's a warping that is pushed uh, by uh, Hindu supremacists in academia. So there is this desire to control academics who push back against these narratives and who want to teach a more uh, factually sound version of Indian history or talk about Indian politics in a certain way. Um, but certainly, yes, there's a lot more research that uh, we hope to see about the impact of uh, college uh, 
college Hindutva on uh, students? Yeah, we we had a report, uh, our ceasefire report, which shows that um, Muslim students experience a large uh, a, a spike in discrimination over the last year. So this is something definitely worth more exploration. Um, and to your point, uh, that for the audience, there was a global dismantling global Hindutva conference, which in the United States, which was uh, received a lot of hate and and attacks from Hindutva um, to to sort of silence this conversation. Um, so Harman, I want to add, like, see if you can touch on this next question, which is, you know. How connected are these Hindu national networks outside of India? Um, is there some sort of connection between them? The because you talked about Canada and the um, attacks on six and in in Canada and then in the United States, are you seeing that there is a connection between um, these groups um, in terms of their efforts in the United States, the UK, and Canada? Yeah, you know, I would defer to the to my colleagues on this panel in terms of some of the organizational connections. What what we've been concerned with on a high level is connections between Indian diplomats and the Indian consulate related to targeting of the Sikh community here in Can in the United States and in Canada. Um, that has been a consistent concern folks in the community have recognized. And, um, you know, just again, this week, Ajitha Doval went on the record of saying, yes, the consulates do follow individuals, and he admitted that uh, openly. And so to us, the the surveillance of the community through the use of consulates and um, diplomats is is very concerning because obviously that's that's a function of people then not having the ability to feel safe here in the United States or in India if they go back and visit family, friends, et cetera. And so that's really where our focus has been is more on the governmental side of what are the relationships here um, that are directly impacting. But I know folks on this panel have a better sense of some of the organizational uh, connections. The one thing I will say on the VHPA as well is this is, again, one of the more pernicious forms of um, kind of pushing Hinduism ideology is, you know, the VHPA defines the Sikh faith as a branch of Hinduism um, and kind of tries to subsume the Sikh identity under this Hindu umbrella. And yet at the same time, the Sikh community is being targeted and attacked based off their Sikh identity. And so there's this kind of dual narrative that's being put out there, which is, if you don't fall within the spectrum of what we define you as, we will then attack you and, and attempt to murder you if you do not uh, follow those beliefs. And so for us, that that's really problematic. And we've seen that kind of play out within even the congressional sphere. Congressman Sri Tanadar introduced the Hindu Buddhist Sikh Jain Congressional Caucus without even speaking with the Sikh community, completely excluded the Muslim community and said he led this caucus in the name of South Asian religious unity and, and our question to him, and, and we've raised this many times, is now, well, if it's about unity, why is the Muslim community not included? And why did you start this without any desire from the Sikh community for this caucus to be uh, created? And so the relationships between organizations advising the congressman on creating such a caucus um, and the impact that has when communities are either not being represented or being falsely represented to us is a real concern, uh, especially in the halls of Congress. Thank you. And if anybody else wants to jump in, please, um, please do. Um, another question um, that was asked was, would you talk a bit about the participation of Hindu nationalists in the new right movements, particularly the National Conservatism Conference organized by Yoram Hazani and heavily supported by Catholic and Evangelical nationalists like J.D. Vance, the Muslim exception seems to correspond with the Palestine exception and suggests that Hindu nationalists are using Israel as a model. Would somebody like to um, respond to that first? I can take this one because I was actually at the National Conservatism Conference uh, this year, not as a participant. I should I should be very clear. Um, I was I was I was there uh, covering it with uh, religion dispatches. Um, but um, yeah, it, this was you know for the folks who don't know the National Conservatism Conference. It happens every year um, in the U.S. and also in Europe, and it is uh, this like new right sort of formation. It brings together right wing nationalists, usually from the U.S. and Europe and Israel in particular. Uh, but this year, the gathering in D.C. was notable for the very first time in the in the sort of conference's history that it had uh, right wing leaders from India. It had a leader in the RSS and the BJP, uh, and a BJP parliamentarian um, come and address the conference. And it was very interesting there to see 
the how explicitly and openly not just these two Hindutva leaders, but also just the conference speakers more generally were talking about the need for right wing internationalism. I think we often talk about internationalism as sort of a, a value that the left embraces, but the right is increasingly taking this up as well. You see this at the very high level of Trump embracing Modi and other far right leaders, as well as at the level of, you know, parties and organization and these sort of like like uh, lobbying and, and think tank type organizations that are represented at something like the NatCon conference. But here in the US even, um, you are seeing this increasing convergence between Hindu supremacist groups and the far right. I mentioned the very first Severa report goes into much more detail on this, but we've seen um, notably ways that the VHPA and its affiliates have, for example, uh, appeared on the talk shows of, or had on their own talk shows and podcasts, um, folks like Robert Spencer, Pamela Geller, people who are named by the SPLC as leaders of anti-Muslim hate groups uh, to talk about this supposed existential threat that both the US and India and also Israel face from this like specter of Islamic extremism. Um, that we, we saw at January 6th at the Capitol insurrection, a photo making the rounds on Twitter of someone waving the Indian flag. And some journalists who investigated that found out the man in that photo waving the Indian flag at the Capitol riot was a leader in the D in the D.C. area chapter of the VHPA. And he's still very active in it to this day. In fact, just earlier this year, at the time of the Ram Mandir in Ayodhya, he organized a VHPA car rally in the suburbs of D.C. And his name was listed as a point of contact for that. Um, even the, I think the political rise of a figure like Vivek Ramaswamy really exemplifies this like alignment where uh, between Hindu nationalism and white Christian nationalism, where he speaks in the language of Christian nationalists. He talks about America as a Judeo-Christian country. Uh, he whitewashes, uh, no pun intended, you know, white nationalism and white supremacy, but also is an open supporter of Modi, has spoken at VHPA galas and events. Um, and so someone like him, I think, really represents this. We at Severa often talk about the idea of a multiracial far right, um, across not just in Indian communities, but across the U.S., communities of color uh, have growing far right segments within them that um, the sort of white supremacist and white nationalist far right is actively trying to build alliances with uh, because they recognize that, like, you know, we can sort of use this language of anti wokeness and and these sorts of uh, this this uh, rhetoric and fear mongering um, that works for our base. We can use that to tap into some of these communities of color, particularly like Asian Americans, South Asian Americans, who have historically sort of occupied this quote unquote model minority position that sort of puts a wedge between them and um, other communities of color. Um, and that's something that we're seeing ramping up, you know, in especially in the last few years. And I think. In um, as we look ahead to the aftermath of this election and years to come, I think we're only going to see that increase. Thank you. Then that kind of leads to another question that's in the chat is you're talking about the far right, the sort of, co you know, I don't know if it's a coalition, but confluence of interests that are happening around, um, you know, Hindutva and, you know, anti-Palestinian and, 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 you know, sort of this right wing in the United States. Well, what about um, any democratic left-leaning liberal progressive spaces? Are we seeing those, this infiltrating those spaces as well? Because, you know, mentioning how the language around for college students to get college students, um, you know, into this around, you know, decolonizing or colonization or whatnot. So can anyone speak to that? Because it seems like, it, you know, it might not just exist in the in the right wing spaces, but also be more um, broadly accepted. I just wanted want. to, yeah, like add, um, this kind of answers the tail end of the previous question. And then also this one as well with like the connection to Zionism and colonialism. And, you know, from what I've what I've read and what I see, you know, I see Hindu nationalism being a form of colonialism um, and it leans heavily on a narrative, the Muslim terrorist narrative, uh, which for the last 25 years, you know, almost 25 years has been fueled. And this global Islamophobia, which leans heavily on the Muslim terrorist narrative, this idea that Muslims are inherently violent, we need to protect ourselves, you know, from them, is something that even though, you know, the idea of the Muslim being a terrorist wasn't at the core of Hindu nationalist ideology, it's something that it leans heavily on 
to push its agenda. It helps, just like with Zionism. It's always been an ethnic cleansing, a land grab, colonial aspiration, but the global war on terror is really useful in garnering support from ordinary people from, you know, through a moral panic created amongst ordinary people that, oh my God, we've got these, you know, terrorists amongst us, we need to protect ourselves. And that moral panic becomes this like, you know, manufacturing consent for, for genocide in the case of, you know, what's happening in Palestine and in India with this repression and oppression that Muslims are going through. Um, it's done through this, the use of this narrative. Um, and, and I think those connections are really important, especially since on the global stage, you see an alliance being built uh, between India and Israel and where, you know, the leader of the country is so considers, you know, the leader of uh, Israel, a friend and an ally. Um, and I think that that reverberates with, with ordinary people and, and, and to, to make the connection with like Democrats and people, you know, who are left leaning, I think, again, the Muslim terrorist narrative is really important in bringing people from across the spectrum together, because, you know, to be afraid of terrorists, you don't have to be a racist. You don't hate Muslims. You're just afraid of terrorists. Oh, and the terrorists happen to be Muslims, but we don't hate all Muslims. So it, it's a very useful tool um, that's kind of almost like used as a facade to mask the colonial aspirations. I, I'll, I'll let others chime in. Safa? Yeah, so I uh, actually, coincidentally, Severa released a report yesterday about one organization that chose this line very well, it has been doing so for a while, but more and more has been dropping its mask. And that organization is the Hindu American Foundation. And this is an organization that on its face presents itself uh, just like any other liberal uh, human rights group would in the sense that it has a, a list of things it stands for on its website. It talks about climate change, talks about equality, about women's rights, about um, about civil rights, about uh, religious tolerance and freedom and, and things like that. So everything, everything that a civil rights group should talk about, it does mention on its site. But the more you look closely and the more you dig into Hindu American Foundation's history, um, you'll see that there is a lot, uh, not just on its website, but in the messaging of its senior leaders and its membership uh, that really echoes the rhetoric of Hindu nationalist groups uh, like the VHPA, like the HSS, and in some cases, even the Indian government's talking points itself. And one really prominent example is um, in the Sacramento Bee article's um, recent coverage of how Hindu American Foundation literally lobbied or like made uh, made statements uh, encouraging uh, people uh, in law enforcement to uh, monitor the Sikh community and to uh, increase surveillance of them. Um, and so there's this really dangerous, I think, um, idea al among a lot of people that this is uh, only a an ideology that exists on the right. And it really does walk uh, among uh, democratic spaces as well. So another space where Hindu American Foundation exists is the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Um, again, a place where you would expect that people would talk about, uh, you know, education, uh, policy, uh, human rights, and things like that. Hindu American Foundation has repeatedly taken stances that are against uh, the education about caste in uh, California, in Texas, and other states where they've lobbied against mentioning caste, like even as a historical concept um, in textbooks for school children. Uh, they've gone out of their way to uh, partner with uh, or collaborate with anti-Muslim actors and people who have been very open about their hatred for Muslims who have called for um, who have called for you know more anti-Muslim discrimination and things like that. So here we have like a really good example of how Hindu nationalism can very easily like you know disguise itself as this um, this specter of we only care about Hindu rights in the United States. We're trying to protect other Hindus. We speak for all Hindus and we're just trying to have their best interest in mind. Uh, really, that's not the case. I think, Frenet, you can speak more to this as well, because uh, uh, 
Hindu American Foundation specifically does like to make that claim that it is the voice for all Hindus in, in the United States, uh, when in reality, it is echoing the talking points of Hindu nationalism. It's covering for the Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP in India, um, and it's trying to push for this, like, you know, whitewashing of Narendra Modi and his crimes against Muslims. Um, and they're doing so, unfortunately, um, you know, while operating in liberal spaces. So I'll, pro I'll pass it to either, you know, Harman or Prane to elaborate more on this. I think Harman wanted to speak up. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, Asafa, thank you for raising that point, right? The the specific part of that SACBI article that we were obviously very concerned with um, is that there was an HAF community outreach director who said that a specific Gurdwara in California and Fremont, California, was somehow institutionally connected to drugs, weapons, and organized crime. And within that same article, organizations are saying that members of the Sikh community in California need to be, quote, monitored, right? And so we know where this kind of language and rhetoric goes. We've seen it happen with the Muslim community where you are suggesting that houses of worship are somehow connected to terror or extremism. You are meeting with law enforcement to tell them to track members of that community. And frankly, if an individual, and they're showing pictures of members of the Sikh community, by the way, in these meetings, uh, so if you show someone with a beard and a turban to law enforcement who have no idea about some of the nuances of these community dynamics and say, you need to track these people, they're involved in extremism or terrorism, obviously that's heading in a direction where we all know it's very unsafe for all of our communities at that point. And the part that's been very interesting and frustrating is HAF issued what they call an apology, and yet they continue to quote to articles and post articles saying, hey, look, here's evidence of the crime and violence within the Sikh community and within the Khalistan movement. And yet the very articles they link to have no mention of anything to do with Khalistan. And even the law enforcement in those articles that are quoted are saying, this is no reflection on the Sikh community. And there may be an individual who may be involved in some sort of violent act. Um, and there's not even confirmation that they're Sikh. They just have a Punjabi name. And yet they're drawing all of these connections between who these people are, what they're connected to, labeling them Khalistani, labeling them extremists, and generally maligning the entire Sikh community in the same fashion that has been done with the Muslim community here in the United States. Um, both in the post 9-11 context, but also within this context as well of brown skin, head covering, whether hijab, turban, um, and let's just broadly assume that these people must be up to some really ill intent that's dangerous to our communities. And that, and that is the rhetoric that HEF has pushed in the past week and, and obviously beyond that as well. Thank you all. Um, we are coming at time. So I just have one last question if we can you know, take it in like the last minute or two. Um, it's just kind of synthesizing what was asked in here, but what can we do? That's what people want to know. What can we do to, you know, you all are doing the work. Um, we're very grateful to you. And so just maybe in a, you know, a few sentences, if you want to take that on and then we'll close out the, the webinar. So I can start with um, Harman, if you want to. Yeah, I mean, I think part of what we can do is is what I'm really glad to be see is that, you know, a lot of the folks on this call, we're, we're already in touch with one another in terms of, of understanding the different perspectives of our communities and how these issues are very interconnected, right? I don't think there's a world in which the Sikh community can or should address the issue of transnational oppression without considering the larger context of Muslims and Dalits and Hindus who are critical of the Modi regime that are also facing uh, issues around TNR as well. And so... Part of it, I think, is the the consistent efforts that we all need to make to ensure that there's an education around how these issues are connected historically and in the modern day, and then build the coalitions and support um, to actually address address this from a policy lens and community lens, um, and also like a narrative lens as well, because I do think the narratives around this matter a lot, um, and to the points everyone's kind of raised here, the recruitment and advancing of this ideology is using specific language. And I think it's it's really important that all of our communities and organizations um, ensure that we are, we're are we standing together and rejecting that hatred and rejecting that violence and that really dangerous rhetoric that's meant to target folks. Thank you so much. I, I wish I could ask you all, we are at time. We do need to, um, we need, need to launch a poll about this webinar. Thank you all for participating in this important discussion. Um, I want to let the audience know that our um, report will be coming out to this listserv in a few weeks, along with a recording of this webinar. So uh, very grateful to you all. We'll um, email everybody who attended 
and it will be um, on our website as well. Um, but please take the poll and, and thank you again for participating in this. Really appreciate it.